DiscerningHearts.com presents The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. For over 20 years, Dr. Bunsen has been active in the area of Catholic social communications and education, including writing, editing, and teaching on a variety of topics related to church history, the papacy, the saints, and Catholic culture. He is the faculty chair at the Catholic Distance University, a senior fellow of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, and the author or co-author of over 50 books, including the Encyclopedia of Catholic History and the best-selling biographies of St. Damien of Molokai and St. Kateri Tekakowitha. He also serves as a senior editor for the National Catholic Register and is a senior contributor to EWTN News. The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Dr. Bunsen, thank you so much for joining me. Great to be with you again, Chris. What a phenomenal doctor of the church that we've begun discussing, St. Hildegard of Bingen. Very much so. I mean, last time we uh, covered some of her life, uh, we looked at uh, a little bit of her vision, and I know we're going to talk about more about that today. But we also, I think, got a sense of uh, her era and helped, I think, to sort of explore the extraordinary gifts uh, that she was given by, by God and that she used to the fullest. Um, somebody with such a vast intellectual curiosity and someone who put all of those gifts to the service of the church, to the service of her sisters, uh, and, and really to the, the people of her own time. As we enter even more deeply into her writings, her teachings, it, it's imperative that we make sure we give credit to that wonderful charism of the Benedictines. But we mentioned it before, but this is where she was steeped in her prayer and her, her formation. Yes. I mean, here was somebody, of course, who was uh, asked by popes to head out literally on the road, uh, to preach, uh, to help bring about the, the kind of spiritual reform that was needed for the era. But most of her life, most of her time, indeed, almost all of her lifespan was spent within the walls of her community. And that was, I think, the important spiritual foundation that she had. But it was also the environment in which she most functioned and the one that she was most comfortable in and that is the setting that really helped to create the Hildegard of Bingen, who is proclaimed a doctor of the church by Pope Benedict XVI, and that also nurtured and fostered her path to holiness, to sainthood, that was also recognized uh, through an equivalent canonization, of course, uh, by Pope Benedict XVI. So we can't separate Hildegard from the life that she led uh, within her community and the very heart of that, of course, is Benedictine spirituality and, and the rule. I'm in danger of being overly dramatic when I ask this next question, but I don't know how else to approach this, Dr. Bunsen. What part of the big, vast ocean do we dive into now? <laughs> well, I think to appreciate the, the genius of Hildegard, we, we looked at some of her writings, uh, especially on her natural history on medicine and other things. But to appreciate fully uh, her genius, uh, we need to begin looking at her visions and uh, her three major works, the, the Shivias, the Liber Vitae Meritorum, or the Book of the Merits of Life, and the Liber Divinorum Operum, otherwise known as the Book of the Divine Works. Those three works are her major ones, and they reflect uh, the extraordinary visions that she had uh, that she dictated, uh, that she provided uh, general sketches of the different episodes. And as we learned in the first episode, she was always very much aware of the living light uh, that had exploded into her consciousness. And those are, I think, the works that most define her. And then there are a few other things that we can talk about relating to her literary efforts. Uh, so that's probably the place where you need to start as we sort of dive more deeply into uh, Hildegard's spirituality. I want to put up just a yellow flag of caution for those who uh, become as enthusiastic as you and I have become <laughs> with uh, 
St. Hildegard, that as you begin to explore her material, there isn't a lot out there yet as far as sources that would be, how can I phrase this, worthy of the seeker's desire to walk with her in the arms of the church. There's a lot of of other material out there that could be distracting. Is that a fair thing to say? Oh, I, I think very much so. We're still in the stage in a way similar to what we have seen over the, the last decades with uh, Julian of Norwich, uh, as I think we talked about in the first episode, uh, in which uh, there were efforts on the part of uh, feminist theologians, uh, feminist writers, for example, uh, and dissenting theologians who tried to co-opt her, to claim her as their own. And this, of course, would have horrified Hildegard, who, as, as we talked in the, in the first episode, was adamant each step of the way in discerning her visions to seek the ecclesiastical approval, to secure the not just the, the approval of the church, but the blessing of the church, and also to submit everything that she wrote about, that she talked about uh, to the rightful authority of the church. So far from being a proto-feminist icon, uh, somebody who in her own era tried to subvert authority in the church, Hildegard consistently, uh, day after day, letter after letter, submitted herself uh, to the rightful authority of the church, which is exactly why she sought uh, the council of Bernard of Clairvaux uh, early on, and then submitted her writings to uh, the popes, uh, who understood immediately uh, the, the value and the depth of what she was presenting. But writers today, unfortunately, uh, have attempted to politicize Hildegard. And it, it's a mistake to allow ourselves to, as you say uh, perfectly, be distracted uh, by those slants and perspectives. To appreciate Hildegard, you have to see her uh, to sort of apply something that Pope Francis always says. He, he calls himself a son of the church. Well, Hildegard understood herself very clearly to be a daughter of the church. So if you see that as the lens for examining her writings, you begin to appreciate, I think, the proper setting, the context of those visions and what she's actually saying. And we can add another caveat uh, to reading her work. As is often the case with um, uh, medieval mystics, I, I think in particular of, of Julian of Norwich as a comparison, Hildegard's imagery is vivid. It is, not to put too fine a word on it, at times even brutal in its depth, but also its severity. And you need the kind of guide that only the, the, the authentic church's perspective can provide to understand fully what it was she was seeing. It's because of those those visions, because of that message that she would convey to the church of her time that Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI lifted her up and said, take a look, because that's a message that we can use today. Yeah, absolutely. If you're looking for uh, a reliable, good source to begin the study of Hildegard of Bingen, there is no better source for interpreting her, for understanding her, than Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. As part of his wider general audiences, of course, uh, we, we've talked about this, uh, focused on the great women of the church, in particular, the great medieval women mystics. And he, I think, developed very early on a fascination and a great admiration uh, for the, the writings in the life of Hildegard. So if you want a, a way to have an introduction to Hildegard and her spirituality, go to Benedict XVI. Read, for example, his two general audiences on her, and, but then also read the letter, uh, the apostolic letter that uh, is published at the time of her declaration as a doctor of the church. That is one of the most eloquent and detailed analyses of her, her life, but especially her writings. So that one is a sure and certain guide 
uh, to start understanding her. And within that, one of the things that we see with Benedict XVI's analysis is that what was Hildegard really concerned with, and that was the, the vital question of how to live a virtuous life in light of divine revelation. So you can see in that first book, the, the Shivyas, what does she do? She talks about the virtues, the ideal Christian life. In the subsequent books, she looks at the six visions and writes of the dangers of vice that can destroy the Christian by looking at uh, 35 different vices, each with the proper penance. She contrasts the virtues with the vices, but then she relies on the virtues uh, in, in the Shivyas to guide the reader in the formation of an authentic Christian life. In other words, the formation and perfection of the virtues. And then you can rely on the second book, uh, the, the book of the merits of life, to resist the vices. So in other words, um, she offers a very helpful reflection on the wider understanding of the church regarding theological anthropology, on the theology of the human person. Now, there's something about her writing that for some, when they enter into it, would be, as we've kind of alluded to before, shocking, maybe intimidating, just because of the, the imagery. But it's the same type of jolting that sometimes we receive in the Holy Scriptures when we look at, say, is the writings of Ezekiel or Daniel or even the book of Revelation, there are those of us who would say, oh, I, I don't even go near those, those sacred scriptures. Now, I'm not saying that Hildegard is on par with sacred scripture, but there is something to being open to, to venture into those prophetic-like scenes, isn't there? Yes. Uh, to go back to one of your earlier questions about understanding Hildegard and, and how do we start to interpret some of this, some of this imagery, it's so crucial to remember the proper context of the church that she submitted these visions to rightful authority in the church. Why? Because the church is uniquely qualified uh, to make a judgment as to their veracity, as to their truth, are these, in fact, authentic? Where do they come from? She was concerned. She had a twofold concern. One, are these visions uh, from the devil? Are these diabolical visions? The other is, and this is one of the things that I always loved about Hildegard, her, her practicality, am I simply deluding myself? And you know, scholars uh, and scientists and psychiatrists, literary psychiatrists have... Uh, tried over the years uh, to dismiss these visions as psychological phenomena, or that they, they talk about the fact that she was chronically ill, which of course, is, as you know, Chris, from your long years of study of, of the mystics, uh, that illness is part of the life so often of mysticism. But they focus in particular on her migraines, so they try to dismiss the visions as nothing more than an aura, as they say, for migraines or a prodrome uh, that sort of anticipates or precedes the onset of severe migraines. And yet here these visions uh, are too defined, they're too rich spiritually to be mere symptoms of either a malady or self-delusion. And yet here was Hildegard worrying that these might be delusion, that somehow she was fooling herself. Why did she, how did she find a way to solve that? Well, she turned to the source that she knew would be able to judge most properly, and that was the church. The visions that she had, I can only imagine at times, must have been absolutely overwhelming for her. And uh, she talks in her visions, for example, of, of the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and she saw uh, the Son of God on the cross, and then she has that, that vivid, vivid description of the church. She says, shining like a splendor, hastening forth from the ancient council, she said, and brought to him uh, by means of the divine power, she said, 
Uh, she was bathed with the blood that flowed from his side and joined to him in happy spousal uh, through the will of the, of the father. Now, that image to see must have been, as I said, really quite overwhelming and, and must have left her quite staggered. Yeah, there is so much in these volumes. And would you say, Matthew, that in all of the doctors of the church that we have discussed up to this point, and of course we're in the, the beginnings of the new millennium, that in Hildegard we really see the first who has communicated that depth of mystical experience. I mean, I don't doubt that Augustine and a number of the other doctors that we talked about I have have tipped into the, in that area, and maybe they even experienced it themselves. But Hildegard is the first one that has it so clearly and so incredibly documented. Yes, yeah. Uh, her literary output in this regard is, is crucial to appreciating the, the range of her mysticism. And that the lesson here that we're going to see played out again and again uh, as we appreciate the, the mystics to come in, in, the, in the succeeding centuries. I'm thinking, for example, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Therese of Lisieux, and others, is to go back to her obedience to the church, to placing herself uh, under rightful authority. But also, the, the call to give an account of what she saw. You know, it, it's interesting when we look at her third and, and the, 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 arguably her greatest work, uh, what's called the, the Liber Divinorum Operum, uh, that she started in 1163 but did not even complete until uh, 1173. By that time, she was 75 years old, which was an almost unheard of age for that period of history. So she managed to live far longer than most people did in her time. But she was commanded to describe these visions. And why? Because they would be of benefit to others, something that she understood. But she kept going back to her own humility. You know, that's been dismissed by some uh, feminist writers as uh, a, a sop to the authority of the church, that somehow she was pretending to be a, a, a humble woman when in fact she was uh, manipulating uh, people of her time. I mean, what a cynical view to take of somebody who you then hold up as some sort of a role model for the spiritual life. Her humility, her awareness of her own fragility, made her the ideal instrument for these visions. And she wrote, as she said, with a trembling hand and traumatized by more illnesses than she could count, she said. And as she started the task, she said, I looked to the true and living light and asked, what should I write down? And what she wrote was what she saw. So there's a testament here to the veracity of her words. And that's important for us today because she was unwilling to write anything that she did not see and then what she did see, she submitted again to the proper judgment of the church. And that is something that we're going to see again in Doctors of the Church and is a hallmark of her holiness, is a hallmark of why she's a doctor of the church. It also, would you say, Matthew, that because of that, I, I keep going, I use the word steep often. I'm thinking of steeping a tea bag you know, in this divine well of grace that she did from her prayer, that it allowed her in truth to speak truth out of love because of, of her experience. And so when she spoke truth, sometimes it wasn't always easy to hear. And that is the experience of many of those who have been led by the Spirit because of that great steeping to speak out when reform is needed. Yes. Yeah, Hildegard stands, uh, certainly in the eyes of uh, Pope Benedict, as one of the great reformers and models for reform in the life of the church. Uh, 
as her as her reputation grew, especially after the, that formal approval from uh, Pope Eugene the Third, she corresponded with people from all over Christendom, and she wrote advice to monastic communities because they wrote to her. Uh, she was constantly being sought out uh, for advice. She defended the church very powerfully, but she was also uh, somebody who encouraged authentic reform uh, among the clergy, among the faithful, including uh, bishops and priests, and, and called on them to be faithful to their call and to embrace the very reform and renewal that was most needed by the church in that era. And uh, she considered herself a prophet. Why? Because she was chosen, despite, as she said, her very lowliness by God to serve as a trumpet in an hour of need. Her, her vision for this was some of the most uh, vivid uh, in all of her writings. Uh, she talks, for example, uh, with this great lament that uh, in words that are strikingly modern and very familiar to us today, she talks about uh, that now the Catholic faith wavers among the people and the gospel goes limping among them. And the powerful volumes that the learned doctors explicated with great study ebb away in shameful apathy. And the food of life of the divine scriptures has been allowed to grow stale. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's pretty strong language. But then she even goes beyond that to describe the church and this is uh, something that Pope Benedict XVI quoted in an address to the Roman Curia in 2010 when he spoke of the clerical abuse scandals. She wrote of the church, they have spattered my face with dust, torn my robe, darkened my mantle, and blackened my shoes with mud. I mean, that is an image for those of us who've had to live through the, the, the terrible years of the sex abuse scandal. What better image could you possibly have? Mm. And that's just one aspect of what she brings once again into the life of the church in our reflection. Yes. Because she had to deal with also reform even within this, the community that she was in. I mean, the, the, the Benedictine community, it, it started out as a, in that microcosm. What was affecting it there, it affected you could see it throughout the rest of the church. Yes. Yeah, uh, the, the, the monastic life, uh, in a way, was a, a, a very good uh, thermometer, so to speak, of taking the temperature of the wider church. Mm. Uh, as the monastic communities needed reform, the church needed reform. And we see that consistently throughout the history of the church, that uh, uh, we, we have a good understanding of the health of the institutional life of the church, uh, through her her servants, through her ministers. And that was something that, that Hildegard understood very well. And we can see, for example, her early desire to move her monastic community. Why? Because she wanted to establish a new community that would be uh, free to grow, uh, to really embrace uh, the, the rule, uh, and to do as much good as possible in a different part of Germany, in places where uh, the, the mass community could do the most good. I mean, we have ways have to remember that in medieval life, the monastic centers were not just places where monks and nuns gathered to pray. These were centers of life for all of the surrounding territories, in some cases, whole regions, mm -hmm. uh, thrived and survived and lived uh, because of the teaching of the nuns and, and monks, their prayer life, uh, but also just the practical things. That is where people went for medical care. That is where they went in times of need, in times of danger. These were sanctuaries of knowledge, uh, but also of life, medical care, of food, of justice, uh, and where you could always go for places to find Christ. Uh, in what was a very violent age. There's so much we could continue to talk about with St. Hildegard. Uh, but in the conclusion of this particular conversation, 
what would you have us uh, reflect on or ponder about this great saint? Yeah, I, I think um, to note that you know, she died um, at the monastery of Rupertsburg in, on September 17th, 1179. But even before her death, she was revered as a saint. And her reputation for sanctity, the fama santitatis, was already across most of Christendom. It took many centuries for her canonization, and, and there were different stops and starts to the process. Not that it was ever shut down, but that it, things like this have their own pace. And yet this great reputation, the, the, the reverence, the veneration that people had for her was pretty persistent throughout all of the centuries after her life. And it was thanks to a, another great scholar, somebody who in the future might very well be declared a doctor of the church, and that's uh, Pope Benedict XVI. With his election in 2005, uh, he really encouraged the greater study of her life. And so today when we think of, of Hildegard of Bingen, the fourth woman honored as the doctor of the church, she's now, I think, going to be tied very closely in history with her great admirer, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, who is, as I said, the first and best introduction that you can possibly find uh, to this remarkable uh, doctor of the church. Beautifully said, Dr. Bunsen. Thank you so much. Great to be with you, Chris. Looking forward to our next episode. You've been listening to The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. To hear and or to download this program along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to support our efforts. But most of all, we pray that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. 